I suck. I'm irrelevant. Everything I make is worthless, according to me. And that's all that matters, right? Me? <sighs> Arrogant loser. Stop. Focus. I want to be better, the best version of me I can be. I want to watch more films. I want to read more books. I have to actually finish things, though. It's hard to be motivated these days. A six-pack would be nice, but I hate routine. I keep quitting yoga. I'm going to get fat. I know it. But that wouldn't matter if I loved myself. I think I'd love myself if I made something worthwhile. <sighs> Probably not. Moon makes the most of a micro-budget, and the unsung hero is the cloning effect. I mean, it was absolutely terrifying because the film utterly depends on that effect working. They used every trick in the book. Split screen, motion control, face replacement, but the simplest effect is Sam Rockwell's performance. I need a haircut. A real one this time. Stop shaving your head. Go to a hairdresser. Go somewhere. Am I lazy or depressed? I'm researching. I thought you researched yesterday. It's a multi-day process. I can't start until I have everything figured out. Okay. Hey, Jess. I got the last piece of cheesecake. I <sighs> hope you don't mind. Or are you watching a video essay? Yeah, I'm working on a video about adaptation. Basic research. Oh, uh, I can see the hamster wheel turning. Hey, guess what? I'm gonna make my own video essays. Just like that, huh? Just like that. I've already thought of a name. The Super Critic. Like I'm a superhero. Isn't that great? Do you have any tips for a beginner? I just bought Final Cut Pro and I'm ready to Final Cut Go, bro. Um, I don't know, it's not really that Have you seen Zack Snyder's Justice League? Dude, it's so epic. The cinematography is like Kubrick level insane. Much better than Joss Whedon's cut. You know the backstory, right? Zack Snyder was the original director, but had to step away because of a personal tragedy. So Warner Brothers hired Joss Whedon so they could reshoot the final product. And they ruined it. But Zack Snyder released his version this year. I want to compare both versions and explain why the Snyder Cut is better. What do you think? I feel like I've seen it before. Yeah, but not from me. James, there are thousands of videos covering every superhero film ever made. The algorithm rewards frequency. So when a creator gets a lot of views, they're encouraged to make more of the same content. It won't have any integrity. It won't have any effect on the industry. If anything, you're only helping Hollywood's brand. They'll do it again, providing you incentive to talk about it again. And you'll be one of many cartoon avatars creating a symbiotic feedback loop with a faceless corporation. You really think it'll get a lot of views? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Rosebud. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. Instead of a bum, which is what I am. Let's face it. Bond. James Bond. What we've got here is failure to communicate. Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> I'm going to make him an offer again with you. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. May the force be with you. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. I am your father. I'll be back. 
I feel the need, the need for speed. Oh, oh God. I'll have what she's having. You're killing me, Smalls. Run, Forrest, run. Houston, we have a problem. To infinity. To begin, to begin, how to start. At the center of this nesting doll, this story within a story within a story, is John LaRoche. John LaRoche is a tall guy, skinny as a stick, pale-eyed, slouch-shouldered, sharply handsome, despite the fact he's missing all his front teeth. In 1992, the Seminole tribe hired LaRoche to build a plant nursery in Florida. He was obsessed with orchids, but specifically the ghost orchid, which only grows in the Fakahatchee Strand State Preserve. Removing wild orchids is illegal, but LaRoche wanted to make money and clone them to prevent future poaching. So he was opportunistic and altruistic at the same time. The Seminoles were exempt from state laws protecting endangered species, so with that and a few case studies, LaRoche figured they could remove the orchids on his behalf. In 1994, they were arrested for poaching, and the media roasted them. But that caught the attention of Susan Orlean, a journalist for The New Yorker. The judge asked him what he did for a living, and he began spooling out this list of accomplishments which he capped off by saying, Um, I'm probably the smartest person I know. Thank you. You're very welcome. To me, that was it. I thought, I've got to write about this guy. Here we go. Orlean shadowed LaRoche, and in 1995, she published The Orchid Fever. The article was successful, and she kept researching the botanical world for her book, The Orchid Thief. And for whatever reason, Hollywood wanted the story. You want to make it into a movie? Into a movie. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's really... <laughs> How does that sound? That's very exciting. Who's going to play me? Oh, well, I've got to write the book first, John, and then, you know, they get somebody to write the screenplay. In 1998, the studio hired Charlie Kaufman to adapt The Orchid Thief, while Spike Jones directed their breakout success, being John Malkovich. There's a tiny door in my office, Maxine. It's a portal, and it takes you inside John Malkovich. You see the world through John Malkovich's eyes, and then after about 15 minutes, you're spit out into a ditch on the side of the New Jersey Turnpike. Sounds great. Who the fuck is John Malkovich? Being John Malkovich hits every Kaufman hallmark. An awkward man obsessed with a carefree woman. Artistic struggles and recursive loops within loops, like what happens when Malkovich goes into his own portal? Malkovich, Malkovich. Malkovich, Malkovich, Malkovich. Malkovich, Malkovich. 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 We all just loved the Malkovich script. Thanks. Such Thanks. a unique voice. Boy, I'd love to find a, a portal into your brain. <laughs> Trust me, it's no fun. <laughs> but instead of adapting The Orchid Thief, Charlie Kaufman wrote about his struggles adapting The Orchid Thief, featuring Charlie Kaufman as the main character. I've written myself into my screenplay. That's kind of weird, huh? It's self-indulgent. It's narcissistic, it's solipsistic, it's pathetic. I'm pathetic, I'm fat and pathetic. I'm sure you had good reasons, Charles. You're an artist. Charlie Kaufman also invented his own twin brother, Donald Kaufman. Narratively, a lonely guy with writer's block isn't very exciting, and his internal monologue can only do so much. So a twin dramatizes two stylistic extremes. Okay, I've got this, this screenwriter who is working on a script, and he has no friends and no social life, and there's nothing dramatic about that. I didn't know how to show it, so I thought, okay, it's really 
you know, that stupid identical twin idea that people always do in movies, I thought was really funny. So I thought, okay, I'll give him someone to talk to. Am I in the script? And they're both credited as writers. So when Adaptation was nominated for awards, presenters had to acknowledge a fictional person. And I like to pretend they weren't in on the joke. And here are the writers nominated for Adapted Screenplay. Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman for Adaptation, based on the book The Orchid Thief by Susan Orlean. And the BAFTA for Adapted Screenplay is awarded to Adaptation. Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman. Unfortunately, neither Charlie nor Donald are here tonight. But everyone else is real. Half the fun of adaptation is imagining how this got made, how real people felt about their characters interacting with a screenwriter they had never met. I started flipping through the script, and I thought, who is Charlie Kaufman? Isn't that the guy who wrote the movie? And, and then I continued flipping through until I got to the scene, I'll never forget this, where I appear on a porn site. And I thought, wait a minute. Spike Jones directed being John Malkovich and Adaptation, and they share most of the same crew, so they're great companion pieces. But the real people in Malkovich are celebrities. The audience doesn't know them personally, but we do have basic assumptions. Portals don't exist. Actors don't become puppeteers. So through context, everyone understands that this is satire. Yeah, uh, there's the truth and there are lies, and uh, art always tells the truth, e even when it's lying. But Kaufman felt that adaptation had a greater responsibility because it was someone else's work, someone else's experiences. The book was a bestseller, but some viewers may be unaware that any of this is biographical. I think that movies lie a lot, and um, maybe I'm trying not to lie in some of these things by, by saying that I am lying, you know? Then I'm not lying anymore, if that makes sense. It's very important to me to make clear that these are real people, but I'm lying about them. But then when I was in a position of actually putting words in Susan Orlean's mouth and saying, she said this, when she didn't say it, I felt I, felt I couldn't do it. And so I wanted to sort of step away from it. And, and that's why I made Susan Orlean so over the top, not Susan Orlean. That's why I made her a murderer. That's why I made her a drug addict. Because it's not true, and it's clearly not true, and I'm telling you it's not true. And Susan Orlean, that I, I apologize, you know, for... <laughs> the second half, and, uh, and to Charlie Kaufman, who tried very hard to adapt your book, Susan. It's unusual that Kaufman made himself the main character, but it's not that unusual. Orlean does the same thing. Every journalist has to filter their subjects through their observations. She writes about her parents, her time in Florida, and she acknowledges her own article. People recognize LaRoche within the book we're reading. She's the main character, and LaRoche's image is hers. There's not nearly enough of him to fill a book. So Orlean digresses in long passages, blah, blah, blah. No narrative really unites these passages. New York Times book review. I can't structure this. Adaptation is just one more step removed. By writing himself into a screenplay, Kaufman is questioning truth. Isn't this process really artificial? The audience has to read between the lines. Charlie's fat, he's balding, and he sweats like a melting candle. But Kaufman isn't fat, he isn't balding. But he does sweat a lot, so I'll give him that. Sweat forms on his brow, how did I know? It's amazing. You know, because I wrote this a week ago, so. Charlie Kaufman put himself in the film. Sort of, you know, it doesn't really look like him, but it, it is him on some level and on another level it isn't. Charlie is socially paralyzed, especially on the set of Malkovich, and everyone acts like they hate him. But I don't know if Kaufman felt this way, or if this actually happened, or if this is just something he needed to tell his story. There's this feeling on the set that everybody's got a job and everyone's running around doing something and as the writer I'm just kind of standing there in the way. You, you're in the eye line. Can you please go off the stage? I don't think anyone really hated me. Um, <laughs> but but I didn't I didn't feel loved. After the film, Susan Orlean wrote a playful prologue in her book where she interviews herself. 
Susan asks, Is Charlie Kaufman a friend of yours? Susan answers, No, he's not. I met him once for about two minutes on the set of Adaptation. We were both tongue-tied. Susan asks, Does he look like Nicolas Cage? Susan answers, No, he looks like Charlie Kaufman. You don't get it, do you? Movies are movies, life is life. They aren't the same thing. Susan asks, Is that remark supposed to make me feel stupid? Susan answers, No. I'm sorry if I was curt. I am just trying to be clear about what is a movie and what is reality. Everyone curates themselves for a particular purpose. Orlean curates herself. Kaufman curates himself. And I curate myself. Can you trust the way I portray myself? A great essay needs a hook, something bold, stand out. Why is my video worth their time? I mean, it's not, but I have to make people think that. Susan Orlean has a great quote about opening lines. She says, I always start writing with my opening line because it just sets the tone in such a powerful way that I can't imagine going back later and pasting it on. It doesn't have to be a miniature encapsulation of the story. It can be a tiny sliver that's just sexy enough to draw you in. That's perfect. How do I do that? What's sexy? Adaptation is great. We open on Charlie Kaufman, fat, old, bald, repulsive, sitting in a Hollywood restaurant across from Valerie Thomas, uh, a, a lovely statuesque film executive. Adaptation is best known for its meta screenplay. Kaufman writes the characters, and the characters write the world that they're in. Irony devours irony, like a snake eating its own tail. Ouroboros. I don't know what that means. The snake, it's called Ouroboros. I don't think so. But The Orchid Thief is partly adapted. It's not just writer's block the movie. John gets arrested. John meets Susan. Susan studies the botanical world. And they go looking for a ghost orchid without finding one. Life seemed to be filled with things that were just like the ghost orchid. Wonderful to imagine and easy to fall in love with, but a little fantastic and fleeting. Out of reach. The end. Adaptation isn't about writing. I mean, it is, but the screenplay is used to connect broader ideas together. Love, time, nature, passion, judgment, loneliness, evolution, and disappointment. The book has so many concepts that a movie can't reasonably resolve them all without resorting to lazy conventions. Why can't there be a movie simply about, about flowers? I guess we thought that maybe Susan, Orlean, and, and, and LaRoche could fall in love. Okay, and but I'm saying it, it's like I don't want to cram in sex or uh, guns or car chases, you know, I, or characters, you know, <laughs> learning profound life lessons or growing or coming to like each other or overcoming obstacles to succeed in the end, you know? I mean, it's, it's, the, the book isn't like that and, and life isn't like that, you know, it just isn't. And <clears throat> you know, I, I feel very strongly about this. Can you make a movie about a flower? Or are you doomed to make a movie about sex, drugs, and violence? And that's the limitation of film, or the expectation of film. 
you can't progress without change. You can't deviate into vignettes. You can't fragment, at least not without risking profit. Robert McKee writes, Seasoned professionals who read your minimalist or anti-structured piece may applaud your handling of image, but decline to be involved because experience has taught them that if the story is inconsequential, so is the audience. Charles, this guy knows screenwriting. People come from all over to study with him. I'm Robert McKee, and I am the author of the international bestseller and award-winning book, Story. Robert McKee published Story in 1997, based on his popular lecture series, and he establishes the essential foundation of screenwriting. Protagonist, desire, conflict, how scenes become sequences, how sequences become acts, and how all of the pieces are arranged into structure. Hey, Charles, you'll be glad. I have a plan to get me out of your house pronto. A job is a plan. Is your plan a job? Drum roll, please. I'm going to be a screenwriter, like you. As an amateur screenwriter, Donald studies the word of Bob. He reads his book, he attends his seminar, and he becomes his acolyte. Which might be the worst thing to happen to Charlie. This one's highly regarded in the industry. No, no, don't say industry. I'm sorry, I forgot. I pitched my screenplay tomorrow. Mom. Don't say pitch. Sorry. Cool, I really like Trust to Kill. Until the third act denouement. That's not how it's pronounced. Sorry, I, I, okay, sorry. McKee's influence is powerful. The stage is his church and the congregation is captivated. He's confident, educated, brutally honest, and he has a solid track record of celebrity endorsements. All these things and more I know on account of being on Robert McKee's story seminar, starring Robert McKee in the title role. Peter Jackson called him the guru of gurus. His students have gone on to win Oscars, Emmys, and Golden Globes. Don't you want to write Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones? His course is like a club membership, and that's attractive to people who want to get their foot in the door. Anybody who says he's got the answer is going to attract desperate people, be it in the world of religion. I just, I just need to lie down while you explain this to me. <sighs> Sorry, I apologize. Okay, go ahead. McKee doesn't actually guarantee success, even though he's perceived as formulaic. He writes, yet form does not mean formula. There is no screenplay writing recipe that guarantees your cake will rise. Story is far too rich in mystery, complexity, and flexibility to be reduced to a formula. Only a fool would try. Rather, a writer must grasp story form. This is inescapable. But classical storytelling is his forte, and anything outside of those parameters, anything abstract, is treated suspiciously. So this rigid, archaic perception holds up. McKee has gone so far as to write Ten Commandments of screenwriting. Uh, because writers, like all artists I would imagine, uh, wish to be free. They don't, they don't like the idea of limitation. They want to be free, free to do anything that they want. But of course, the, the desire to be free as an artist is one of the most suicidal notions you can have. My problem with that sort of thing is just saying that this is the way to do it. Right. You know, I think you need to figure out your own way to do it and your own path. Um, so um, I don't have any problem with people teaching it. Right. I just have a problem with dogma. There are no rules, Donald. And anybody who says there are oh, is, but, but, is just, but, but, you know, no, not rules, principles. McKee writes that a rule says, you must do it this way. A principle says, this works and has through all remembered time. Play it once, Sam, for all time's sake. I don't know what you mean, Miss Elsa. Play it, Sam. Play as time goes by. The irony is that teachers who have turned screenplays into a formula have also turned teaching into a formula. They don't have to learn anything else or adjust for new films or new media. They figured it out once, rinse and repeat. If Casablanca is the golden standard, then everything else is coded. At first I was nervous about putting a song in a thriller, but Bob says that Casablanca, one of the greatest screenplays ever written, did exactly that. Mixed genres. Julius and Philip Epstein wrote Casablanca. Uh, they were twins. You mentioned that in class. 
finest screenplay ever written. My screenplay professor showed us Casablanca and had the same untarnished respect for it. But he also showed us Red Letter Media's Plinket reviews, so I don't know which way is up anymore. <laughs> I paid thousands of dollars for this. Get a life. <laughs> Get a life. <laughs> if you're debating whether you should go to film school, just watch internet videos instead, maybe. Welcome to class, everyone. I'm glad you can make it. Years from now, you'll be standing around a posh cocktail party congratulating yourself on how you spent an entire weekend locked in a room with an asshole from Hollywood for your art. In my classes, there were always people who just didn't get it. They did everything they were supposed to do. They studied, they checked the boxes, but their writing was awful. And I felt so bad for them because they were expected to transform basic advice into advanced works of art but they had no emotional honesty or any ability to impart feeling on other people. They were wasting their money and none of it made a difference. You will say, here, this is what a screenplay looks like. You will discuss character arcs, how to make likable characters. You will talk about box office. This is what you will do. This is who you will be. And after you're done, I will feel lonely and empty and hopeless. I think Kaufman hates reduction more than anything. Labeling every single aspect can misrepresent a film. This is the arc. This is the midpoint. This is the genre. Adaptation is funny, but I wouldn't necessarily call it a comedy, even though it's technically advertised as such. Who's gonna play me? Oh, like I think I should play me. A confused IMDb account writes, This movie was classified as a comedy. Roger Ebert thought it was great. Others hilarious. I thought it was sad, sad, sad. Looking for a comedy, I was extremely disappointed. Some things don't neatly fit into categories. And that's Charlie's biggest obstacle with The Orchid Thief. It's hard to mold the book onto a typical screenplay. What's the arc of static nonfiction? What's the midpoint in a series of anthologies? What's the genre when it switches between social, comedic, adventurous, historical, and biographical? It's about flowers. Robert McKee writes, Pity the poor screenwriter, for he cannot be a poet. He cannot use metaphor and simile, assonance and alliteration, rhythm and rhyme, synecdoche and metonymy, hyperbole and meiosis. The grand tropes. Instead, his work must contain all the substance of literature, but not be literary. A literary work is finished and complete within itself. A screenplay waits for the camera. So Charlie constantly fights these rules. I mean, principles. But Kaufman follows them well, intentionally or not. Charlie is a clear, definable protagonist. He has clear motivations to write an exceptional screenplay. There's a controlling idea that's corrupted by a counter idea. And even though there's a sharp left turn in the third act, seemingly out of nowhere, all of those things are properly set up beforehand. Kaufman just has to flip the switch. Adaptation is so self-aware that it's almost impossible to criticize. Not that some haven't tried. Film critic Stephen Gray Danis writes, Film critic Stephen Gradonis writes, Give Kaufman credit for this much. He's not afraid to put into words exactly why some people won't like his movie, or to give hostile critics ready-made ammunition to use against him. Because I'm pathetic. Because I have no idea how to write. Because I can't make flowers fascinating. Because I suck. Adaptation gets to have it all ways. Kaufman adapts part of The Orchid Thief by accepting his failure to adapt the rest. You see that nectary all the way down there? Darwin hypothesized a moth with a nose 12 inches long to pollinate it. And everyone thought he was a loon. And sure enough, they found this moth with a 12 inch proboscis. 
Proboscis means nose, by the way. I know what proboscis means. He follows traditional Hollywood advice, but also makes fun of it. I'll start over. I need to face this project head on. And And God help you if you use voiceover in your work, my friends. God help you. It's flaccid, sloppy writing. Any idiot can write voiceover narration to explain the thoughts of a character. And the structure is deceptively simple and quietly complex. It works both ways. There are two storylines, adaptation relating to nature and adaptation relating to literature. Even though it cuts back and forth, time is linear. That's normal. Plenty of movies have storylines in two different eras. In Julie and Julia, Meryl Streep's character is in the past, connected to the present by her book. Hey, wait a minute. In adaptation, Susan is in the past and Charlie is in the present. And that's an acceptable place to turn your brain off. But if you imagine the screenplay's process, the way it's fictionally constructed, Events have no origin and no conclusion. It's like a time travel paradox. The future influences the past just as much as the right way around. Since adaptation is quote unquote written by characters in the film, half the movie is finished before it's been written. Or is it? Events in the beginning are created in the middle, which are informed by events in the beginning. When Charlie has writer's block, this is created when Charlie writes that Charlie has writer's block, which is informed by when Charlie had writer's block. Susan's book passages are adapted after Charlie figures out how to write his screenplay, but this arrangement is the very thing that motivates Charlie's breakthrough. Which came first, the chicken or the Ouroboros? So from the screenplay's perspective, the beginning and the middle circle around each other, and this pattern repeats again for the last half give or take. Time is linear, but process is non-linear. Or linear from a different perspective. You follow? Good. Anyone else? Don't open with history, it's boring. It'll put people to sleep. Although, some people like to fall asleep to video essays. I'm getting paid anyway, so does it matter if people watch the video? Do I matter? What's the point of a video essay anyway? I don't know what I am. Am I a critic? Am I a scholar? Am I a documentarian? No, I'm a parasite. A video essay is just a remix. I'm taking someone else's thoughts and words, crunching them up, and repurposing them as my own. It's not original, it's just an adaptation. Huh. What is adaptation about? It's about writing, right? Screenplays. That's the theme. But what makes this one special? Screenplays have existed for a century now. That's it. Begin at the beginning. Start with the silent films. Melies and the Comedians. No dialogue existed. Well, except for the title cards, but whatever. And then BAM! The talkies! A burst of music and sound! A montage of every great movie quote of the 20th century. (laughs) Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet! Every quote comes with a cool graphic, typing out the dialogue like an old typewriter. To infinity and beyond! We travel all the way to the 2000s, ending on Charlie Kaufman, hovering over his typewriter, and BANG! The essay begins! This is great. This is the breakthrough I've been hoping for. It's never been done before. This ties everything I figured out my together. title. Zack Snyder's movies are really psychological. Sucker Punch has like a reality within a reality within a reality. So I have to prepare everyone for how complicated it can get. The Snyder Cut explained. Don't put explained in the title. By definition, every video essay is explaining something. It's cheap. It's clickbait buzzword bullshit. Everyone's looking for easy answers, and explained is just a flare gun. And worst of all, cliched. A writer should always strive for something new. Like the nostalgia critic? No. He's really funny, and he has really great structure. He goes back and forth between talking about a movie and doing a parody. Please don't do skits. They're distracting, and it's the fastest way for the audience to realize that you're not talented. 
The Nostalgia Critic has 1.2 million subscribers, Jess. Do you have 1.2 million subscribers? You know, his brother helps him write his reviews. Don't. What? Writing is a cosmetic problem. It's a way to express complex emotions and organize life. And sometimes creative people try to fix their insecurities with art. But if it doesn't work out, if the process is stuck, then those insecurities get even bigger. Well, I'm glad you took the orchid script. Yeah. yeah, I think it will be good for you to get out of your head. Charlie stumbles through life like he's naked, a pincushion for disgust and judgment. Is he attractive? Is he talented? And most importantly, do women like him? I mean, that's what this is all about. Every woman is refracted through Charlie's perception, romantically, sexually. One looks like a gymnast. One looks like that girl in high school with creamy skin. But one looks like a New York intellectual with whom we do the Sunday Times crossword puzzle in bed. One looks like a Midwestern beauty queen. One looks like Amelia. Charlie's in love with his friend Amelia. She's sophisticated and she understands his shyness. She's also British, but nobody's perfect. They go out, but she's waited a long time for him to make a move. What are you up to now then? Oh, um, I should probably get to bed. I have a lot of work to do tomorrow. Well, good night then. Overthinking is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Charlie is afraid of rejection, so he acts awkwardly. Amelia picks up on that awkwardness, which enhances his awkwardness. The Ouroboros strikes back. Charlie knows what he wants, but he doesn't know how to actualize what he wants. And if that sounds like a screenplay, I think that's intentional. So um, anyway, I have to go to Santa Barbara next weekend for this orchid show up there. I thought maybe you could come. No, I don't think I can make it next weekend. I don't think I can. I've got something, sorry. Okay. So, well, okay then. Uh, so, good, good night then. Good night, And after all of his navel gazing, he misses the boat. This is David, my friend. Hi. Hey, nice to meet you. Uh, Amelia's talked a lot about you. Hi, I'm Donald. Hey. Caroline. <laughs> Since Charlie can't be with a woman he knows, he redirects his energy towards strangers like a shotgun blast of pent-up loneliness. Kaufman keeps circling back to this dynamic, men who fetishize women simply for being women. Oh, thank you. No, puff bad. Too many guys think I'm a concept, or I complete them, or I'm gonna make them alive. But I'm just a fucked up girl who's looking for my own peace of mind. Don't assign me yours. We were celebrating our anniversary, stopped in for a drink, and then this guy kept looking at me. It is a nuisance, the occupational hazard of being a female. You can't even go for a drink, always being looked at. He was a creeper, you know? But adaptation is much cringier. It's painful, unless you're feeling as slimy as Charlie feels. He spends most of his time consumed by dysfunctional fantasies. Good afternoon. So what looks good today? First, a waitress. Pretty, friendly, and in person. They make small talk, but Charlie is so affection-starved that he interprets it as flirtation. Or maybe, maybe he can turn it into flirtation. Orchids. I love orchids. Well, cool, that's... Huh. I mean, let's face it, they don't look very good. And, <laughs> and, and they don't... And he's so in, uncomfortable that it makes me uncomfortable when I'm watching, like, oh no. I'm going up to Santa Barbara this Saturday for an orchid show, and I, and I, I... Oh. I'm sorry. Well, um... I apologize. So I'll just be right back with your pie then. Oh. And the waitress has every right to reject him. He's being weird, overly familiar, and invading her space in a place where she can't truly react. It's her job description to be nice. And the worst part is that Charlie knows this. He knows he's tripping over social contracts. But how do you reconcile being undesirable and the desire to be with someone? Is it so much to ask for people to think you're hot or smart or funny or talented? And 
what do you do if you're not? Where's that chapter in the key? Nobody gets laid for writing. Are you kidding me? You're a genius. Which line? You're a genius. You're a genius. <sighs> And isn't that what everyone wants to hear? You're a genius? And not because they're oblivious or polite, but because they have taste, and they still think you're amazing. It was the best script I've ever read. That's why I wanted to do the project. It really is. It's like, really great. <sighs> but most of all, Charlie is obsessed with Susan, or the idea of Susan, someone who can't reject him. They both participate in this synchronized dance, researching the same information. If Susan reads about orchids, so does Charlie. If Susan goes to an orchid show, so does Charlie. He wants to impress the original author, but it's more for selfish reasons than artistic ones. It's like listening to your crush's favorite song. He's doing it because it means something to her, and therefore it means something to him. Even though he's never met her, Adaptation presents a typical parasocial relationship, this one-sided relationship with media. We grow attached to someone's picture, their style, their voice, and it feels intimate, but it isn't. It's hard to separate media when it's designed to influence you, and there may be unexpected reactions. All of this talk about propagation, well, it's almost erotic. Orchids are the sexiest flowers on earth. The name orchid derives from the Latin orcus, which means testicle. I feel bad for Susan Orlean because adaptation is part of her legacy. I mean, I don't feel that bad. She likes the movie and it boosted her book sales, but she's permanently tied to this embarrassing wet potato. I don't think authors intend to be masturbated to. I, for one, will accept nothing less. But they do want to connect. They're sharing something about themselves to the world, and a stranger might see past their professionalism. I can see your sadness. It's lovely. Well, I'm just tired, that's all. That's my problem. <laughs> Kaufman saw through the text. He predicted that Susan Orlean's first marriage was bleeding out, which ended a year after she published her book. I wrote the book at a, a kind of a difficult time in my life, and I hadn't really grappled with the fact that it was difficult in terms of my marriage. And so when I first saw the, the um, script, I was really rattled. And I thought, how did he know that? I mean, I don't know him. I had never met him. How did he discern through reading this book that this was somebody going through something that was totally unrelated to the writing of the book. Well, I think if I almost died, I would leave my marriage too. Why? Because I could. Because it's like a free pass. Nobody can judge you if you almost died. Barriers are attractive because they provide possibility. Distance is flexible. Mystery is customized by your imagination. And fantasies are eventually crushed by skepticism. Is that waitress still attractive if she's ditzy? Is that producer still attractive if she's phony? Is that writer still attractive if she's basic? If Charlie actually met Susan, she wouldn't be as fascinating because she'd be a person like anyone else. Susan Orlean is here? Yeah, she's, she's here in, in time for reading or something. Anyway, she's just on the phone. Sit down, have a seat. She's, she's dying to meet you. Oh, um, um, well, I, I, should, I should probably go. And this confusion is amplified in the digital world. We're all voyeurs here. Adaptation would be completely different if they made it today because there are so many ways you can overstep boundaries or misinterpret interactions. You can browse Susan Orlean's social media right now. The internet is so open. I'm just a tiny public figure, and even that's scary. Normally I narrate my videos like I'm doing now, so I'm nervous about showing up on camera. Oh wait, I haven't decided to write myself in my script yet. 
Although you've seen footage of me so far, so... I'm sure you know where this is going. Ha! Process humor. When I watch other creators who conceal their face, they're kind of mythic. I have a notion of what they look like based on their voice. So when they show their face, I have to recalibrate because it's never what I imagined. Oh, that's what you look like. You're a person. But what if I connect with them even more now? Now I know what they look like. Now they're more relatable. Now we're best friends. And it's just as ambiguous on the other side. How am I supposed to feel when millions of people watch my content? How am I supposed to feel when a hot film journalist writes about my work? And I read almost every single comment. To be fair, some of them are negative. But some people call me a genius. They don't know me. I don't feel like a genius. But you know what? I like it. I really like it. And I don't know if that's healthy or not. One comment writes, I have watched all of your videos and it truly amazed me how wonderful your works are. I could listen to your thoughts all day. So fucking genius. I hope you're not going to read it because it makes me feel like a creep, but your mind, man, I feel really attracted to you right now. Hey Jess, what? I got my green screen. It's bigger than I thought it would be. Ah, that's what she said. Speaking of which, my girlfriend's going to help me film my first video. Did I tell you I have a girlfriend? Caroline? You'd like her. She's super hot, bro. Go away. It's been a while since you published a video. How's your Andy Kaufman script coming along? Charlie Kaufman. Right, Charlie. What's the rating going to be? How do you rate movies anyway? Out of five or out of ten? The Nostalgia Critic doesn't rate movies, but Jeremy Johns' highest rating is awesome-tacular. I don't rate movies, James. That defeats the purpose. Well, if you did. If you have to resort to fractions, the system is flawed. Three and a half, four and a half. The five star rating is just a truncated version of the 10 point system. Cool. So what should I rate the Snyder Cut? I don't know, James. That's up to you. <laughs> well, I'd give it a 10 out of 10, but I don't want to come across as biased. Well, a 5 out of 10 pleases nobody. Okay. Maybe a little higher, then. A 7 out of 10? Something for everybody. Perfect. You'll figure it out, you know. You always do. Good night. By now, you've probably noticed that Charlie is a weenie. Nobody likes a narcissist except the narcissist, and even that's debatable. Self-love and self-hatred are two sides of the same coin. Both are active pursuits. The only cure for overthinking is not thinking at all. Imagine me and you. I do. Come on. I think about you day and night. It's only right. Come on, sing with me. When people say I love Donald, I get jealous because I don't remember playing Donald. I was so into the Charlie Kaufman headspace. Nobody's ever done a movie about flowers before. So, so there are no guidelines. What about flowers for Algernon? Well, th that's not about flowers. Oh, okay. And it's okay. not a movie. I'm sorry, I never saw it. Donald writes a screenplay called The Three, a psychological thriller about a cop hunting a serial killer who keeps a woman trapped in his basement. Donald embraces every trope imaginable, even making his three characters one person with multiple personalities. Isn't that fucked up? The only idea more overused than serial killers is multiple personality. On top of that, you explore the notion that cop and criminal are really two aspects of the same person. See every cop movie ever made for other examples of this. Mom called it psychologically taught. A lot of movies in the 2000s ended with a multiple personality twist, most notably Three, based on the book by Ted Decker. Spoilers for Three, I guess. <laughs> Who cares? They replaced one letter with a number three, so get ready. You know, he seems to be obsessed with threes. The prologue opens on Jennifer, a police psychologist targeted by the Riddle Killer, 
a psychopath who taunts his victims with elaborate mind games. Some guy brought this by for you. He said you'd understand. She plays the game, but she can't solve the last puzzle, so the killer blows up her brother. Three months later, seriously, three months later, Kevin and his friend Samantha are targeted by the killer. He leaves clues, threats, and bombs. Kill me. Shut your lying, filthy mouth. We hate you. That's right, traitor. You go. Go. Kevin. Leave. Kevin. Leave. Kevin. Leave. Kevin. Are you okay? The twist is that Kevin, Samantha, and the killer are the same person. Stay back, Jennifer. Listen to Sam. Shut up! You two are driving me crazy! Samantha represents good, and the killer represents evil. You want to kill the evil inside yourself. Ah! You're me, Kevin! Confess it! Confess it, Kevin! You're me! Kevin, you're me! And some viewers may notice subtle clues layered across this masterpiece. Who are you? Who are you, Kevin? Uh, it's Kevin, he came back home. That's not Kevin, Pumpkin. That's a stranger. It was you. You did this! You know me better than I know myself. Maybe he changed his personality with each victim. Double twist, Kevin was just imitating the riddle killer, and the real killer was the hot dog vendor in the prologue. Wait, what? That's his real job? It's not a disguise for the mind game? I intended to pay him a little visit. I can't stand copycats. Three is basically an off-brand mashup of Seven and Fight Club, lifting the cliches at face value while ignoring the details or subversions that make them special. The characters are just archetypes, and there are so many plot holes that it can't function as a mechanical procedural. It's awesome. I give it a 3 out of 10. And it's the kind of popcorn trash that Donald loves. Except the 3 is Kaufman's satire, which is funny, and 3 is completely serious, which is even funnier. That's kind of good. I like that. See, I was kidding, Donald. Oh, okay. Sorry. You got me. <laughs> Do you mind if I use it, though? Adaptation spends a lot of time on this high concept. Since Donald was invented for the movie, it suggests that Donald might be Charlie's alter. Every now and then, adorable goofball Donald is framed in a very ominous way. You shouldn't have done that. Because <laughs> it's extremely helpful. I meant to ask you, I need a cool way to kill people. <laughs> Don't worry for my script. Das machst du alles wirklich. And this broaches what a genre film might do. Even if twins are individuals, they're usually depicted as psychologically connected. And if there's darkness, that darkness is within. <laughs> Robert McKee writes, most telling of all perhaps is Dead Ringers, a film about the ultimate fear, the fear of the person closest to you, yourself. What horror will crawl up from your unconscious to steal your sanity? In this case, the darkness is bad screenwriting. Right now, I'm working on an image system. Because of my multiple personality theme, I've chosen the motif of broken mirrors to show my protagonist's fragmented self. 
Bob says, an image system greatly increases the complexity of an aesthetic emotion. The multiple personality subtext is pushed further if you consider the three is about someone who's obsessed with a woman. And who do we know who's been fantasizing about a woman but actually pleasuring himself? So the cop gets obsessed with figuring out her identity and in the process falls in love with her, even though he's never even met her. She becomes like, like, like the unattainable, like, like the Holy Grail. It's a little obvious, don't you think? It doesn't make any sense because they're all different people in different places, but that's the point. I mean, how, how could you have somebody held prisoner in a basement and, and working in a police station at the same time? Trick photography. Okay, that's not what I'm asking. Charlie's experience comes with a lot of baggage. Expectations are high, trust is unlimited, and he's worried about competing with his past work. He doesn't want to be boxed in by anyone, including himself. And that creates a lot of anxiety. If he can't figure out the orchid thief, then maybe he's just a one-hit wonder. The, the book has no story. There's no story. All right, make one up. I mean, uh, nobody in this town can make up a crazy story like you. You're the king of that. No, I, I didn't want to do that this time. Every artistic endeavor can't be the best. Eventually there's a peak, but that doesn't stop self-criticism. An experienced writer has to spot their tics, analyze when something isn't working, and expect worldwide feedback. That doesn't happen to people without a following. They're so innocent, they just make things to make them. Implications mean very little. But anyway, it's cool for my killer to have this modus operandi, because at the end, when he forces the woman who's really him to eat herself, he's also eating himself to death. I'm insane. I'm Earl Bros. I don't know what that word means. Donald is the devil on Charlie's shoulder. As much as Charlie hates superficial incentives, he gets jealous. Donald gets laid. A little push, push in the bush. <laughs> You're such a <laughs> See you, Charlie. Donald gets praise. Donald's script. Smart, edgy thriller. It's the best script I've read all year. And Donald gets money. Easily. Marty says he can get me like high sixes against a mil five. That's great, Donald. Selling out is seductive. It's easier to make something that's been made before. That's why blockbusters are so formulaic. They've worked before, they'll work again, and even the bad ones make money. The worst movies with the most problematic scripts become the most successful. Like brunch, like what is brunch? You wait in line for an hour for essentially lunch. It's like a battle between commercialism and purity, like movie versus film. I'm putting in a chase sequence. Uh, so the killer flees on horseback with the girl, the cops after them on a, on a motorcycle. And it's like a battle between motors and horses, like technology versus horse. And there's still all one person, right? Bless the big payoff. It sounds exciting. When the last act changes directions, it's ambiguous whether those events really happened, or if Donald wrote the ending, or if Donald doesn't exist and Charlie just gave in to his temptations. Which is what Kaufman did, but for a different purpose. It did fail. It did fail. It, be, it, didn't win, it became this thing that, that didn't resolve itself in the, same, in the same form or at the same level that it started. And that was intentional. It went into this other world, you know, Everything that he said he didn't want to do obviously happened. All of these cliches happened, but they happened really. I mean, we really, we really, Spike and I really tried to do them. Charlie's failure is Kaufman's success. The ending isn't a parody, it just is, which makes it the best kind of parody. It's so sincere that some people misinterpret the ending. They either take it literally, or maybe they get the joke, but they can't really digest it. Film critic David Nusser writes, By the time the third act rolls around, the movie's turned into a bizarre hybrid of romance and action, with the Kaufman twins being chased by LaRoche and Orlean, who want them dead because they've stumbled upon their cache of illegal flowers. Presumably, all this stuff has something to do with a variety of cliches the Donald character has inserted into the screenplay he's writing, called The Three. It's an amalgam of virtually every thriller churned out by Hollywood, a screenplay embraced by everyone except Charlie, who sees it for what it is. So are we to assume that adaptation has actually morphed into the three? Uh, yeah, David, pay attention. 
just for fun, how would the great Donald end the script? <laughs> Shut up, the great Donald. Reality itself starts cutting corners. Integrity is corrupted by simplicity. That happens all the time. Power structures sink their teeth into art. Life is chewed up and abbreviated. Everyone has to understand. What's the logline? What's the soundbite? This thing has to be marketed. Rightfully so. Studios are trading millions of dollars in this business. So depth is replaced with spectacle. Think less, feel better. <clears throat> We're big fans. Oh, thank you. LaRoche is such a fun character. Uh, yeah. The people surrounding Susan gloss over her work. They smile, they congratulate, but they don't really want to engage with her material, especially with John LaRoche. They've already stereotyped him. He's a swamp redneck with no front teeth. That's your eccentric comical character, right? And she said, oh, LaRoche is such a fun character. No shit, I'm a fun character. LaRoche is a fun character, isn't he? Absolutely. <laughs> He's really quite a character. No front teeth. Doesn't seem to bother him at all. Though. Why doesn't he oh get them God. fixed? It seems almost sociopathic to make everybody look at that. Nobody gives a great blowjob, eh? <laughs> but LaRoche's life is full of tragedy after tragedy. His sister died three years before he was born. She asphyxiated on a tumor that fell across her windpipe. After that, his mother became suicidal, and she verbally abused him as a child. But, you know, sometimes bad things happen, darkness descends. I'm so proud of you two. Mm -hmm. Hey. Oh, which one is it dead? Sir, please, don't no, move your head. Which one is it dead? In 1990, his mom and his uncle died in a car crash, and his first wife was in a coma for three weeks. And she divorced me, you know, soon after she regained consciousness. Then Hurricane Andrew destroyed his first nursery, which left him homeless and out of work. Now the beginning makes more sense. He's not delusional, he's adrift. Everyone has a story, and the worst writers can't see past caricature. Um... But it's not only about flowers, right? I mean, you have the crazy plant nut guy, right? He's funny, right? It's a bird! It's a plane! It's the super critic! How's it looking, babe? It looks great, babe. I just... You are a genius. <laughs> genius. Who am I kidding? I didn't major in film, I just took electives. I've never seen Sunset Boulevard. I think The Godfather is boring. I'm a joke, just ban my channel already. I should just read the plot summary and make jokes the whole way through. Jokes, 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 baby! It doesn't matter if it's good. Context doesn't matter. It's, it's like spaghetti. Something's bound to stick. I have no critical qualifications. I suck. That's all I know. Start with Jesse Tribble. He sucks. All he does is watch TV and jerk off. He's built a career out of sitting on the couch, but he's stuck. He has nothing to say. Every idea creates more caveats and he's blocked by incessant negative self-talk. So fuck it. Copy the movie. People like parody skits, right? Then, you know, talk about history and feelings and shit. LaRoche and Orlean and Kaufman and Malkovich. Malkovich! Many stories have a, a singular question. This had so many questions. What was the Fakahatchee Strand? Why would you collect orchids? Why did he have, in particular, a crew of seminal men with him? It's the feeling that a door just opened onto a world that I didn't even know existed. And I thought, I need to know more. The Orchid Thief is an existential mystery. Every thread creates another thread. Communities are built around orchids. People have been arrested for orchids. People have died for orchids. 
Why? In the book, Susan Orlean asks a park ranger why people are so obsessed with orchids. Oh, mystery, beauty, unknowability, I suppose, he said, shrugging. Besides, I think the real reason is that life has no meaning. I mean, no obvious meaning. You wake up, you go to work, you do stuff. I think everybody is always looking for something a little unusual that can preoccupy them and help pass the time. Hobbies are supposed to be immersive, and fans are delighted by knowledge, elegance, and the chase. And other fans. It doesn't matter what the topic is as long as it scratches that itch. John has a long history of collecting things before dropping them completely. Turtles, fossils, and tropical fish. Then one day I say, fuck fish. I renounce fish. I vow never to set foot in that ocean again. That's how much fuck fish. In real life, LaRoche says he was attacked by a shark, and a few months later, a moray eel. Still, I like the idea of someone moving on just because. I know people like that. They devote themselves to one singular thing, usually to cover up lifelong trauma. And when they get bored, they pick something else. But why? Done with fish. After his court battle, LaRoche got rid of all of his orchids and moved on to computers. He built websites for businesses and posted pornography on the side. You know the thing about computers? The thing I like is that I'm immersed in them, but it's not like a living thing that's going to leave or die or something. Good things come and go, so maybe we push them away before they can break our hearts. Susan Orlean is the same. How much of her investigation was a distraction from personal misery? I think some people were really spending time with me because they were lonely. I wanted to want something as much as people wanted these plants. But it isn't part of my constitution. I suppose I do have one unembarrassed passion. I want to know what it feels like to care about something passionately. In some ways, the book is about self-discovery. What makes Susan Orlean feel alive? What's her purpose? Journalism is motivated by curiosity. And is that any different than plant enthusiasts? What kind of fool undertakes this really unpleasant journey just to get this orchid? And I kind of looked around and I realized that there was only one other person in the swamp. And it was me. But that's the end of the book. I wanted to present it simply, without big character arcs or sensationalizing the story. I wanted to show flowers as God's miracles. I wanted to show that Orly never saw the blooming ghost orchid. It was about disappointment. I see. Charlie adds himself into a screenplay, but that doesn't give him an ending. When he writes his first draft, he has a premise, but his dual narratives have no way of coming together. How do you finish something that's happening in real time? I'm going to New York. I'll meet her. That's it. That's what I have to do. Don't get mad at me for saying this, Charles, but Bob's having a seminar in New York this weekend, so if you're stuck... There's a lot of pressure on a film's ending. If the beginning establishes interest, then the ending has to deliver on that promise. People want to know, what does it mean? What's the relevance? What are you trying to say? And if there isn't a clear answer, if the whole thing meanders, then the audience might feel disappointed. Sir, what if a writer is attempting to create a story where nothing much happens, where people don't change? They don't have any epiphanies. They struggle and are frustrated and nothing is resolved. More a reflection of the real world. Charlie's low point, his desperate hour, is attending Bob's seminar. Ah! He's out of options. He's begging for help. His pride is torn to shreds. 
Robert McKee fully embraced that he was controversial, and he suggested that Brian Cox should play him. He didn't want to be sentimentalized, as long as it was funny and he got a redeeming scene. And I love that he filters his portrayal through his own screenwriting truisms. The notion that there's no conflict, that real life is without conflict, is the most naive, <coughs> ridiculous thought a person can have. First of all, you write a screenplay without conflict or crisis, you'll bore your audience to tears. Secondly, nothing happens in the world? Are you out of your fucking mind? Mm -hmm. So I read the screenplay and I saw that it was wonderful. It had third act problems, but I saw what he needed. He needed somebody to push up against. He needed my character to represent um, everything that he was against in terms of wanting to be an artist in, a, in, a, in the commercial world of Hollywood. And why the fuck are you wasting my two precious hours with your movie? I don't have any use for it. I don't have any bloody use for it. Okay, thanks. Charlie wants a contradiction. He wants his hopeless existence to have a profound conclusion using an artificial medium. But as soon as you start typing, as soon as you press record, you've moved into a new dimension. Stories are comforting because we give them meaning with language and construction. Life isn't that simple. Things change, things adapt, but nothing stops. That's what evolution is, a series of complex circumstances that merge into a moving present. Endings are just points in time with extra significance. Wild them in the end, you got hit. You can have flaws, problems, but wild them in the end, and you've got a hit. Find an ending, but don't cheat. And don't, and don't you, you dare, dare bring, bring in, in a deus ex machina. Interior, living room, day. Jesse reads his first draft. His script finally catches up to his analysis. All he has to do is resolve reality, article, book, film, essay in his own narrative, and he'll be happy. I can't do this. This is insane. There's no way to end this. Am I going to copy the whole movie? Am I going to fight Charlie Kaufman in the Everglades? I have to buy a camera. I have to show my face. I don't want to show my face. What if someone calls me ugly? I can't. I can't handle that kind of rejection. It's not worth it. There has to be another way. Hello, I'm a nostalgia critic guy, remember? So you don't have to. There's something awkwardly innocent about it. Like, even though no one acts like a real person in this, they're so passionate about however they're acting. Huh. Maybe the nostalgia critic is right. I'm getting too fixated on content. I should focus on the presentation instead. The words don't matter as long as I say them loudly enough. I can be a cartoon. Yeah, bro. I showed my video to a bunch of sponsors, and I got an offer from Squarespace. They said it was unheard of for a first-timer. And I couldn't have done it without you. Hey, Jeff. Caroline says hi. Hey. <laughs> We're totally naked right now. Congratulations on your sponsorship. Thanks, Jess. So, could I... Well, I was wondering if you wanted to read my first draft. Of course, I'd be flattered. Okay. Okay, bye. Wow. Thoughts? The opening is really strong. I've never seen anyone jerk off in a video essay before. It's kind of metaphorical, huh? Yeah. 
I feel weird about filming it. Though. No, don't. It's bold. It's avant-garde. It's postmodern, like like the brown bunny. I hope it doesn't get demonetized. Well, if it does, I'll make a call to action about how people can support my channel on patreon.com slash Tribble and contribute as little as $1 per video, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, organically. Yo, that's wicked smart, bruh. Do I get to play me? Ideally, yeah. I don't want to act by myself and do split screens. Yeah, that would be awkward. How about the rest? Well, you nailed all the pretentious thematic stuff, but I think you're missing the big picture. What big picture? You know, the drama. Adaptation was a critical darling. There is no drama. I don't know if that's true. I did my own research and I found some pretty damning evidence. Did you know the original version was written by Donald Kaufman? What do you mean? Donald's not real. No, no. His name is in the credits. He was nominated for an Oscar. Yeah, Charlie made him up. He was doing like a meta thing. No, see, that's a myth. I found this article on a website called the Donald.win. It says Donald Kaufman wrote the first draft, but had to step away because of a personal tragedy. So Columbia Pictures hired Charlie so they could rewrite the final product. Charlie wasn't even a character in the original version. It was supposed to be an action-packed adaptation of The Orchid Thief. That doesn't sound credible. Okay. Remember at the beginning of the movie, Charlie said he didn't want his story to be about a heist or a drug running operation. But what's the end of the movie about? A heist and a drug running operation. Right, that's a commentary on- No, no, don't let that college nonsense cloud your judgment. It's a plot hole caused by studio interference. Look, go ahead, read it. Two different voices, Jess. Make it make sense. James, I need to borrow your green screen. Adaptation's third act explodes onto the screen and here's where things get weird. My brother did some research and sources say that there are problems behind the scenes. The third act feels like an entirely different movie because it is! Donald Kaufman is a real person and his original vision was a kick-ass, nerve-jangling thriller. My genre's thriller, what's yours? Um, is moping a genre? I mean, check out that title, The Orchid Thief. It's practically a heist movie waiting to happen. But Donald had to take time off because of a personal tragedy. So his brother, Charlie Kaufman, rewrote almost all of it and the studio buried the secret. And that's why Donald writes act three. And I rest my case. But what do you think? Fake news or another example of studio interference? Let me know in the comments. Donald flies to New York to save Charlie's script. Well, somebody has to. This, we're gonna fix your movie, bro. Donald impersonates Charlie and interviews Susan. He asks her if she and John keep in touch and she seems evasive. Relationship ends when the book ends. And I thought, I like this guy. I mean, as a subject, sure. I like this guy. <laughs> yeah, we're not buying it, Susie Q. Donald does research on John's website and find Susan Orlean front and center. Let's be honest, she's the Meryl Streep of porn acting. Flashback to the swamp and guess what? Susan lied in her book because they found the ghost orchid. It's a flower. Well, what did you expect? An Oscar nominated screenplay? John tells Susan that the Indians only helped him pick orchids to extract a drug. What? I can't say Indians anymore! Hey, don't cancel me. Charlie said it first. Florida and orchid poaching, Indians, it's just, it's great. Susan snorts the Shrek dust and falls in love with John. <sighs> what can I say? I like a man with no teeth. Back in the present, the Kaufman boys are on the case. Charlie catches up with the audience, finds the drugs, and spies on Charlie and Susan. 
I swear I'm not a pervert. I've just been creeping on women the entire movie. Susan is a respected journalist. So what are they supposed to do with this fat witness? Murder him, obviously. It's a real Sophie's choice. You gotta calm down. You're getting a little emotional. Keep it up, Bruno. Keep it up and I'll start mansplaining too. They force Charlie to drive into the swamp, but they don't realize that Donald is hiding in the back seat. I swear I'm not a pervert either. Run! Run! The Kaufman boys run away and hide in the swamp. And here we get the lesson of the movie. You are what you love, not what loves you. Thank you, movie. On their way out, John clips Donald in the shoulder. They manage to get away, but a truck comes out of nowhere and whee! Charlie tries to keep Donald awake by singing Happy Together by the Turtles. Imagine me and you, I do. <laughs> Play. <laughs> Play. Despacito. Most of adaptation is kind of slow, but I have to admit, the ending really picks up the pace. This is proof that Donald Kaufman is a better writer, no offense, because he knows when to be emotional and when to cut to the chase so that all of it makes a bigger impact. Bonnie and Clyde chase Shakespeare back into the swamp. John is about to shoot Charlie, but hello, Deus Ex Machina! See you later, alligator! Okay, even I apologize for that joke. Oh, you fat piece of shit! He's dead, you loser! Shut up! You ruined my Shut life, up. you Shut up. fat f f You lady! You're just a lonely, old, desperate, pathetic drug addict! Harleen, 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 Harleen! I'm begging of you, please don't take my man. Charlie goes home and writes about everything that happened. And this shot of an empty chair symbolizes that Donald is dead. But I feel like Charlie Kaufman is trying to apologize for pushing Donald Kaufman out of Hollywood. I, I miss him, you know? Charlie hangs out with Amelia. Remember Amelia? He kisses her and finally tells her that he loves her. Yay! 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 Um, she's dating somebody, bro. Hashtag me too, am I right? Aww. Aww. Charlie goes home to put the final touches on his screenplay, the end. Adaptation is great, but it's all over the place. Pick a lane, people. The first two acts are unique, but it's pandering to whiny intellectuals. We get it, you're subversive. The last act is awesome, but it's so random and short. If Donald's vision was realized, this could have been a huge blockbuster. But Charlie's witty dialogue gets in the way. Most of it's fine, they just don't go together. And that was adaptation. It's a little uneven, but it makes you think. I'm Jesse Tribble, and I'm giving Adaptation a 7 out of 10. Something for everybody. How was that? Dude, that was awesome. I'm so fucking awesome. Mm -hmm.